Hey, what is up? Enjoying your blended family. Welcome to all the B fams tuning in to this week's podcast. This week's podcast is actually a continuation to last week's podcast, which is what to do when your kids want to go live with their other parents. Last week, I shared with you and answered a couple of questions around the topic of our kids going to live with their other parents and how it all came about, um, how old they were when it happened, and why we let them go, and if you should let them go, and just all of the things to the beginning part of our story. So if you haven't listened to that one, I highly suggest you go ahead and stop this one and go back to last week last week's episode and listen to that first because today's is going to build off of that. Today's episode, I'm going to answer the questions of what did I do while they were gone, while my biological kids were gone living with their dad, and what made them come back. And both of these questions have some very specific answers. Anybody that's walking through this season of life with your kids right now, my hope and my prayer is that you're going to take some of these things and you're going to put it into motion and then you're going to begin to see drastic things changing in your family. So we'll get into it right after this. When we first became a step family, just like you, we didn't quite know what we were getting into. Scarlett and Randall Tandy here from Enjoying Your Blended Family, and we have been a blended family for over 15 years. And not only did we have to figure out how to handle the day-to-day -day struggles that come with being in a step family, about seven years in, our biggest fear happened and each of our kids went to go live with their other parent. We went through seasons of zero connection with each one of our kids, and we had to get really creative on ways to reestablish and reconnect those relationships. And through prayer and becoming very intentional, God restored our family in, in true God-like fashion and made it better than we could have ever imagined or hoped for. So God has called us to help other families do the same thing, to make those connections. So if you're looking for stronger relationships, deeper connections, and more communication, then we believe it truly starts with being intentional and creating these fun opportunities in our family. Click the link so that you can get quick access to the process that we use to help you find common interests in your family so that you can be more intentional on spending time with your kids, your spouse, and your family as a whole. We believe you can take the step out of step family and create a blended family that you truly enjoy. You can find our podcast on Enjoying Your Blended Family on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. And while you're sitting there, go ahead and follow us on social media. So when you have more fun, you'll see less problems. All right. So we're going to start with the question of what did you do while your kids were gone? So just a refresher. Summer of 2017 is when we went through a very short period of time where none of our kids lived with us. My younger two had went to go live with their dad. I finally let go of control. And even though the courts had ordered a 50-50 temporary summer order, every time the kids were coming with me, they were doing things that were unhealthy for them in order to upset me, frustrate me, or they were just trying to cope and deal with their own emotional issues. Um, during that season of life, I was so self-focused on how their decisions and their actions were affecting me as their mother. How dare they do these things that were causing me so much distress and messing up our perfect little family that I was trying to create that... Um, I can't even tell you exactly what all they were going through because they didn't open up and I didn't know how to communicate with them in that way. And then my stepdaughter, at this point, she had been with her mom for the past three years, since 2014. But at this point in her journey at her mom's, she had already left her mom's. It wasn't a good situation for her. And she went to go live with her grandmother in another state, her mom's mom. So 
She was starting to figure out some things for herself. She was graduating high school. She was trying to figure out what was next for her. And Randall did some very specific things to to connect with her, um, which we've shared on other podcasts. I'm not going to get into all of that today because that is his story. And today I'm sharing with you my side of the story. But just know that he was very intentional in connecting with her. So during this transition of my kids leaving, she ends up coming back. So the the timeline is all just a little bit cloudy because I was probably going through an emotional breakdown, but I didn't know that I was having an emotional breakdown during that time period of my life. It wasn't until I came out of it that I realized what was really going on. So during this time period, while they were gone, these are the things that I did to help me get out of this dark place that I was in. The first thing that I began to do is I began to really seek the Lord in a way that I never had before. I was so lonely because I didn't know what to do with myself anymore because I had always been full-time mom and stepmom and our lives revolved around the children and their activities. There was so much cleared up on our schedule now that I began to have, and I was a teacher, so I had summer off that I took some time to really dig in deep to what the heck is going on. This is even before I got professional counseling. I began to really ask God and have him just pull up a lot of mess from its roots. And what God showed me that season as I began to seek him is that a lot of the decisions that I made when it came to my kids was fear of judgment from other people. I was making decisions what was best for my kids based on what I thought I would be judged on as a mom for my children, not what was actually best for my children. I was holding on to a whole lot of pride. I would have never in my life guessed that I had a pride issue. But during this time period, I could not let the kids go because I did not want to be wrong. I wanted to show Randall that my kids weren't going to leave me like Riley left him. I wanted to prove to my ex that I was the better parent than he was. I wanted to prove to my mom that I was a better mom than she was. I needed to prove myself to the rest of the world. And I felt like if the kids were no longer in my custody, then I was a failure. And I did not do my part in this, which was to be a good mom to them. And so God began to show me that rejection and that pride and the fear of judgment. And really that I was parenting so much out of fear. I was parenting out of fear that they were going to leave. I was parenting out of fear that they were going to become drug addicts because that ran in our family. I was parenting out of fear that they were going to be teenage pregnancies like I was, like my mom was. All of the decisions that I was doing, I was parenting from this place of fear instead of trusting God in the process. So as he began to reveal these things to me, it just brought a freedom that I had never experienced before. Previously, when I was parenting my kids, when things didn't go the way they were supposed to, I would lash out on them. Randall would never even see this side of me, but I would lash out at them. I would get so angry and upset, but I did all of that trying to force them to submit to my rules, to my morals, to my beliefs and what I thought was best for them. And instead, what I was doing was pushing them further and further away. So what I did during this time that they were gone, the very first thing I did was a lot of self-growth in healing. I read a lot of self-growth books. I went through a lot of processes to get to the bottom of what was going on. And I began to release some of this pain and fear that I had on the inside. And then another thing, as I began to then seek professional help 
during this time. I began to see a counselor during this time as well. And she challenged me to find some sort of outlet. So during this time period, I'd already been writing out different blog posts and just dabbling in that for myself. So I began to find an outlet for all of my emotions and thoughts that I was going through. And I began to write. And then I began to share that with the world. And then I began to connect with other people that were also going through some of these other things. Not all of them were um, due to my kids and the choices that they were making. Some of them were just life issues, women issues and stuff. But that became my outlet. And then the therapist also challenged me to find something that Randall and I could do together that would strengthen our marriage. And so during this time that our kids were gone, I began to really look inward into how could Randall and I have a better marriage. Our marriage, when you get married um, in a blended family, you don't have that time to really learn and grow each other in that like honeymoon period that regular nuclear families have because we had children um, off the bat. Our whole life, everything we did was focused around our kids, their extracurriculars, their schoolwork, church, volunteering, summer camps, EBSs, plays, everything revolved around the kids. And it left little to no time for Randall and I's relationship. But now here we found ourselves in this season that we just began to pour into each other during this season. We were able to open up and lean on each other during this season in a way that we never had before. And as we did that, our relationship grew stronger and more intimate with each other. So first thing I did was I worked on myself. Second thing I did is I worked on my marriage. Third thing I did was my stepdaughter ended up moving home. So she ended up being the only kid in the house now. And so during this time frame, I decided to really just pour into that relationship with her. When she left for her moms, we did not have the best relationship. I say it's so hard. Like, and I don't know if you guys experience this as well. When we talk about our stepmom journey and we talk about how hard it is and how we are the target. We have a target on our back. Our stepkids do these things. We don't feel like, you know, we can even just be ourselves in our own home. There's all of these ugly negative emotions that come along with it, but there's also a lot of beauty mixed in with that. So yes, there was hardship and there wasn't a strong relationship with my stepdaughter. We did have a relationship. I was the mom in our home. We did do things together. We did have somewhat of a bond, but that season when she left to go live with her mom, it was as if all of that was thrown out the window. No good memories existed anymore. And then now when she moved back in, it was like this rebuilding, relearning each other, rehashing um, some of the good times and looking through pictures and going on adventures. Her and I would go hiking and bike riding and go on these different just dates with each other. And I just began to pour my focus into her and she began to see me for the first time for what I was trying to be all along. And that was just a bonus mom to her. It was no longer me trying to prove that I am her mother. It was not me trying to force her to have a relationship with me. She was able to see all the things that I had done her entire life as a positive thing, how I would cook for her, how I would take care of the house, how I would plan events, how I would be involved in different, that I would show up for different things that she was involved in, how I would encourage her to do the things that she wanted to do. I was like her number one cheerleader. So during this time, I worked on strengthening the relationship with the kid that was in the house. We also had a foster daughter <clears throat> during this time, but she was off at school. So during this time too, I did make it a point like going up and visiting her when she was down and the things that I would do with her as well. 
but for the most part, the one that I spent most of my time with was Riley because she was the one living in her house. So what did I do while they were gone? I, a lot of self-growth and healing for myself. I worked on my marriage, strengthened the relationship of the kid that was still left. So for us, it was my stepdaughter. For you, it might be an R's baby that you had after um, after the fact that y'all have had together. But then the last thing I did while my kids were gone, and I say last thing, but this is the thing that I did the most. This was the one thing that gave me so much peace and brought me the control that I felt like I had no more of. And that was pray. From the very beginning, when my stepdaughter moved to the point to where when my own biological kids left, and then even when my stepdaughter came back during this time, I learned to pray and go to war for my kids in the spiritual realm. And I don't know what your religious beliefs are, but we are living here in this world. But the battles that we have are not with flesh and blood. It is not here against our ex or our children or our spouse's ex or the court systems or any of that. That is not where the true battle lies. The battle lies with the enemy. And the way that we defeat him is declaring God's words and his promises over the situation. So I began to read my Bible like I had never read my Bible before. I began to take scriptures and take out words like you or they or I, and I put my kids' names in there and I began to declare God's promises over my family. During this season, not only did I learn how to pray for my kids on my own and I learned how to intercede on their behalf, I believe today that they are alive and they are well because of my prayers. There are things that my kids did while they were gone that should have killed them. There are moments that they have told me about that they should not be here anymore. But I believe because I spent that time in prayer and surrounding them in prayer with God's angels armies, protecting them and keeping them safe, that they are still alive today. And then Randall and I, as a couple, began to pray together. It was awkward as all get out. I even tried to avoid it, even though I wanted it so bad. A friend at work had asked me if Randall and I prayed together. And I'm like, no, that's weird. We pray to ourselves quietly. And so I initiated it. I told Randall, I thought we should start praying together out loud. And then he took the reins. And then I would try to like dart out the door before he would remember that it was time to pray. And eventually though, we began to see the power in us coming together and praying. We would come and we would start arguing and just whining and complaining about all the things that was going on in our family. And then something would click and be like, we should pray about this instead of complaining about it. And we would come together and we would just ask God for his help. We would ask for him to intervene. We would ask for him to show us what to do in these areas. We would ask him to soften the hearts of our children. And we began to see little change by little change by little change until eventually we began to find ways to connect with our kids. So don't discredit. If you feel like you have no other control in your family right now, the thing that you do have control over is your ability to read the word of God and to find his promises and to pray those over your children. And then Begin to bring your spouse in on that. If your spouse refuses to, begin to ask God to soften your your spouse's heart in this area so that y'all can begin to come together and pray. And it makes a difference. I am telling you, it changes everything. So that is what did I do while they were gone? Now, the last thing I want to cover before we wrap up this episode, and that is what made the kids come back? And this this part of our story is different from Riley, Big Riley, Randall's biological daughter coming back and my two coming back. So when Big Riley left to go live with her mom, she only came one time, one month um, before she ended up cutting us off completely because we ended up trying to keep her here after she had come home after that month. 
And then we didn't see her again over the next two and a half years until Randall began to do some very specific things to get her to come back. Then with my two, it be our house became this revolving door over the next few years. Situations would take place at their dad's house to where they were forced to come back and live with us. Um, or one kid would come back because they chose to come back and the other one would leave or the other one would do something and then we would kick them out again. It was a really, really weird space to be in as a parent because after your kids have gone to another parent's house where they have complete freedom to do whatever the heck they want to do, but yet they are still children and they come back to live under your roof and now when you try to put some rules and some guidance down, they go and do whatever the heck they want to do still. Then you have to be like, uh, well, I missed my kids so much. I don't want to push them away again, but I cannot stand for this happening in my house. Like this is not okay. These are rules that we have for our house. We're not going to have drugs in our house. We're not going to be coming home or not coming home at all um, at ungodly hours. Like this is stuff that's not okay, but how do I parent that? So the, the next <clears throat> few years, it was like this weird revolving door. I don't know that if I even tried, I could give you a timeline because I've had, I had other family members bringing them to me and saying, look, this happened over there. They don't need to be there anymore. They need to be with you. And then they would live with me for a little bit. And then something would come head to head again. And then they were right back gone sometime during the period when they weren't able to go live with their dad. Then they were going to live with my mom because they didn't want to live with me anymore. Sometime during that time frame, my mom had a house that she was no longer living in. But, but my younger brother, who was not in a good place, lived with his wife, who was also not in a good place. So there was a lot of unhealthy things happening over there. My kids would go crash over there and live in the little mother-in-law quarters over there with no rules, no nothing, yet they're still children. So there was just a lot of chaos and craziness happening during this time. But what Randall and I both began to do is we made a conscious decision to reach out and connect with them and to let go of any of the stuff that we disagreed with. So as this revolving door is happening with the kids and they would come back in, they would do things that we didn't agree with. So then we would kick them out or they would come back in and they would not like some of the rules that we put into place. So then they would run away or leave or go find somewhere else to live. So eventually we got to a place and I had to say, I'm tired of this revolving door. I need something to be different. So there was this day, a very specific day that I remember being in Hobby Lobby. And I've shared this story in uh, the other podcasts before. Where I was in Hobby Lobby, at this point, I didn't have much communication with my son. It wasn't really that he hated me or that he cut me off. He just, he really didn't have a phone. He didn't have a car half the time. He was living at my mom's other house with my brother and out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. And I didn't agree with the lifestyle he that he had. And I was walking through Hobby Lobby and I saw this young man that looked like my son. And in that moment, I came face to face with what do I do? And as we passed each other, I realized that it wasn't him as we got closer and I was able to see his face and stuff. I thought, what would I do if that was him? And he just completely walked right past me and ignored me. This is not the life that I want as a mother with my kids, that I live in the same town and I have zero contact with them or relationship. And so I said, what, what can I do? So I began to invite my kids out to do things that they enjoy doing. So for my son, 
He's a boy. He likes to eat. So I would invite him to go out to eat. Plus he was young and had no money and no food. So I would pick him up and go take him to eat. For my daughter, I would invite her to go to Goodwill or invite her to go get ice cream or invite her to go just do something simple and easy. And during this time frame, I wouldn't talk about any of the lifestyle choices that they were making. I wouldn't try to make them come live back with me. I just kept it very surface level. Let's enjoy this time together. Talk about things that kind of like when you're with family and you're like, don't talk about politics and religion. I just chose certain topics that were off limits. And I only focused on the things that we could have back and forth conversation with. And that every time began to break down some walls where they would begin to open up with me and mostly my daughter open up with me and tell me things that are going on in her life. Um, Almost immediately with these situations, they would then end up coming back and living with me. They would realize like, okay, I need something different. This isn't good for me. And then they would come and be back in our home again. Again, still weird because the parenting looks so much different. It's one thing to have this little relationship that we could have outside of our home and connect. But now when they come back in your home, having still rules and morals and things that you want them to agree with, finding ways that we could not butt heads was kind of difficult. So during that time, what I had started to do is if I disagreed with something, I would pray about it. I would take it straight to God. Lord, I don't like this. This is not okay. Something's got to give. Something's got to change. Um, show me what to do. And in situations where my daughter would begin to act out and go into old patterns and routines of us yelling and screaming at each other, I had grown so much at that point that I would be able to say, you know what? I'm not doing this. I'm not going to talk and argue with you like this. I'm going to I'm going to be in the other room if you want to come talk with me, then you know, you're more than welcome, but until then, I'm just going to separate us from this situation. And during this when I would do that, without fail, she would come to me. She would apologize. She would open up what was really going on on the inside because the surface level that we were fighting about was just that. It was just some surface level issue when something much deeper was going on. And during that time, we were able to have a lot more healthy conversations and communicate things that we were never able to communicate before they left. So what made them come back was for one, I believe prayer and two, very intentional connecting points inviting them to go and do things on their level. And then three was me just taking certain topics off the table and not arguing about them. So that, my friend, is what we did to reestablish the relationships. What we did while they were gone and what we did to reestablish the relationships. I do not want to downplay at all what you're going through. I don't know that Anybody can speed up this process when your kids are gone. I know for us, it was about a span of six years from the time the first kid left to the time the last kid, our relationship was reconnected. But over that six year period, we learned and we grew a lot. But it wasn't until three years in that we figured out some of these things that we could do. And as we began to do those things, it really strengthened us. It strengthened our faith to hold on to what was going to happen with the other two kids because what we saw happen with the first kid. So if you're in the season of no relationship right now with your kids, hold on to that. What God did for me and my family and my kids, he will do for you and your family too. That he's not going to do it for me and then leave you hanging high and dry. Begin to seek him out. Pray to him. Begin to ask him, what do you want, Lord? What is best for them? What can I do? What? How can I be a benefit here? How can I encourage and uplift my kids in this season and let go of some of these expectations that I have had? And how can I let you be in control? 
And then focus on the people that you can focus on. Focus on yourself, focus on your marriage, focus on the kids that are still left in your house. And then as time progresses, begin to reach out little by little and make those connections with your kids, inviting them to go do things with you. All I can say is when we finally understood it, when we finally began to connect that way, walls came crashing down, relationships restored. But when I was doing it my way before, what I thought was right when I was adamant about the way that I was parenting and what my kids should and should not do, the wall stayed up and they continued to run. And it was a vicious cycle and revolving door and it was exhausting. All right, so I'm gonna pray with you before we leave today. And as always, feel free to reach out. Um, send me a DM on Instagram or send me an email at scarlettandyetm at gmail.com. And let me know what's going on. I would love to pray for you specifically. I set up Zoom calls all the time with people that are struggling and I just hear them out. Um, if I feel like I have helpful advice in that area, then I share it and then I pray with you um, because I know that God can do more than anything, more than we can do on our own. So let's pray now. Father God, I just thank you that you're here present, that it's not an accident that my friend is listening to this podcast right now. Lord, for those that are walking through the season of their kids gone, living with their other parents, that they feel like there's um, just so much pain in their heart during this season, Lord. I just ask that you wrap your loving arms around them, that you give them peace that surpasses all understanding, that during this season that you are taking time to help them uproot and heal any areas in their life that have gone wounded up to this point. Lord, I thank you that you were strengthening their marriages, that what the enemy is trying to use to kill, steal, and destroy their blended family, that you're actually going to take and turn it around and strengthen their blended family. Lord, I thank you that they are seeking you in all that they do. They're leaning not on their own understanding, but they're acknowledging you in your, in your ways and that they know that your ways are way better than our ways, Lord. Help us to be encouragers to our children. Lord, help us to focus on the relationships that we do have still. Lord, if we have kids in the house, help us to let them be seen and heard and have open lines of communication to be able to feel all the feelings that we're going through during this painful time and that we can be honest with each other about how we're feeling that we don't have to build up walls and close each other out, Lord, but that we lean on one another. And Lord, I thank you that you're giving my friend new creative ideas to connect with their child that's gone. Lord, that you are softening the hearts of the child that is gone. That you're opening their eyes to see truth. Lord, that the truth will be revealed. Lord, if there's anything being done in the dark, anything that the the enemy is using to grab hold of our kids and keep them from your light. Lord, I bind it up in the name of Jesus that it has no place in our kids' lives, that they are free and that they are running towards you. Lord, I thank you that you're going to use this season to grow them and strengthen them into the children, into the men and the women that you created them to be that there are lessons that they're learning during this season of their life that they could not learn while under our care. Lord, I thank you that you take everything that the enemy uses to harm us and you turn it around for our good and for your glory. I thank you that your angels are protecting our kids and keeping them safe from themselves and from those around them. Lord, I thank you for the restoration of families all around the world that after my friend that listens to this podcast begins to do these things that we talked about today, that they're going to begin to see immediate changes, immediate changes in their house, in their selves, in their spirits, in their marriages, in their relationships, in their homes, and in their relationships with their prodigal child. 
Lord, I thank you for the children that you're bringing home. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Woo, amen. All right. Incredible stuff, these last two episodes. I do just pray that it has blessed the heck out of you, that God is doing something bigger than you and I can even imagine, that you're going to look back on this day, a year, two years, five years from now, and you're going to remember the moment that things began to turn around. Please send me a message and let me know when things begin to turn around. It just builds up my spirit and my faith when I see God do the impossible. I love you guys. And in the meantime, until we meet again, don't forget to enjoy your blended family. Thanks for joining us today. We hope this episode has been a blessing and encouraged your family journey. Make sure you stay connected with us and join our weekly blended family newsletter. We send an email out every Friday morning full of support and encouragement. And when you join, we also want to give you a free gift. So go get yours today. The link is in the show notes below. Have an amazing day. Remember to enjoy the journey with your blended family and we'll see you on the next episode.